Hey everybody, welcome back to the Nerd Republic. Um, we are going to be going over Mandalorian season finale of season three, episode eight, The Return. I know, I sound very down today. There's a reason for that. Did, did, did somebody kick your, your load cap? You can, you can say I'm that. I'm watching Jay's face, and his face is my reaction inside. I'm like, damn, Mark sounds not happy. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Mark. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it, but it, it, it will be all right. It will be all right. You know, yes, I know. Mark, if you need to pick me up, go watch this week's episode of Ted Lasso. Because everything's going to be all right, all right. Um, so I am, of course, joined, as everybody can see, by a couple of my friendly nerds here. I've got DJ Simmons back with me this week, um, as well as uh, the Jake the Nerd is back as well um, to join us to go over this final episode of Season 3 for Mandalorian. Uh, Jay, how are you doing today, sir? I'm great. I am still disappointed that I missed participating in last week's review uh, I was out of range of the hollow net out in the outer rim. Uh, and I'm so glad to have finally gotten at least within range of hollow net transmissions again. I wouldn't exactly say I'm back in the core, but this is better than nothing. Yes, any hollow net is better than a no hollow net. Great. That. <laughs> as long as Palpatine and Vader aren't on the other side of the call. Jake, how are you doing, sir? I am good. I'm ready to talk uh, some some Mandalorian or whatever the show is now. Can, can I speak about Ahsoka trailer spoilers? Um, two weeks, sure. Two weeks ago, I think it was, I commented how we need to let go of the individual series titles because they were telling a singular story and they didn't care what title character was involved. What they were doing is buying themselves a full season's worth of episodes across multiple series. I think after the Ahsoka trailer dropped, uh, finally, right? Thank you, Lucasfilm, for giving us this a year after everyone else saw stuff. Right. I have words <laughs> about celebration. Last year and this year, but that's not here nor there. We know what the title of the series is. This Uber series that is the one singular story. It's Heir to the Empire. Uh, yes, but, you know, it, we, we really shouldn't be trying to tie that in with the, with the episode that we got to say. Last week it would have been appropriate. Actually, honestly, Mark, it does tie in. Because Thrawn is all about cloning. The Shadow Council is preparing the wave. Oh my god. Jay! You throwed off my whole mantra here. Well, I let's... Again, I broke Jake. Before, let's put a pin in that, three, that third let's, let's put today. the pin back in the, in the thermal detonator. And uh, <laughs> move on a little bit. <laughs> um, so... Uh, before we kind of get into more deeper thoughts, um, let's kind of you know give credit where credit's due. Um, you know, a lot of people put a lot of hard work into these these shows for us, whether we like them or not. Um, wow, Mark, just wow. <laughs> so this week's episode, we have uh, our director is Rick Famuyiwa again. He directed last week's episode, and our writer is John Favreau. Um, and then, of course, our actors and actresses are Pedro Pascal as Din Jarin, or should we say Jarin Din? I don't know. Um, I, I, there's, I have there's, questions there's some about question that. about surname now. Um, we've got Katie Sackhoff as Bo Katan Kreese, uh, Simon Cassinades as Axe Woves, Mercedes Renato as Cosca Reeves, Giancarlo as Posito. Might have been in this episode as Moff Gideon. Um, and Carl Weathers is as Grief Carker. He, he had like 15 seconds in this episode. Um, <laughs> so let's start off with some spoiler-free thoughts. We'll start with Jay. 
Um, okay, let's get this out of the way. Was this episode a strong season finale? Sadly, no. Were there strong beats in it? Sure. Last week's would have been a better place to stop the season, quite frankly. If you ask me. Um, that being said, I don't think it's fair. I've seen some stuff on the internet today. A, an actual bit of a mix of reactions, but mostly doom and gloom. Mostly along the lines of deep, dark depression. Um, go hide inside your helmet kind of stuff. Uh, that I feel like Mark needs his helmet, his Mandalorian helmet, to go hide in after this week's episode. I don't think it's all that. I think there are enough high points that it is worth. It's absolutely worth discussing. Um, and I will fully admit they should have stopped this season at seven episodes. Yeah, really at six. If you cut out the longest episode of the season, that probably would have been better as a short versus versus part of the, the season again this is that business about are we telling heir to the empire or are we strictly maintaining references to the title characters and i think at this point we have to let go as yoda would say we have to let go of our preconceived notions about how series work for this story that the team here is telling when they get eight episodes at a time unlike uh, and or they got they get 12 at a season they've got to be more creative with what they're doing in order to tell the story they're telling especially since it is clearly going to be heir to the empire that being said this was a rushed episode they should have they should have stopped where they did or they should have stopped at seven and we should have had two or three episodes to tell this story at the beginning of next season except that they desperately wanted to be at a particular place in their plot beat for the top of season four and so they forced it and yeah i don't think it i don't think that part worked for them yeah i don't disagree with them telling the the proper long storm long-term story i just think that there was some some fat in this episode that they could have cut um, or in this season really that they could have cut and made it a six episode season versus an eight one uh jake your spoiler free thoughts uh, well, first, you missed Emily Swallow as the armorer. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm pretty sure, Jay, that the awesome beats you're talking about is every time the hammer beats some bad guy in the head. Because I'm telling you what, the armorer with a jetpack just going to ham on dudes is that's right up there with like, I don't know, Obi Wan and Qui Gon just mowing down battle droids. It's yes. Um, there are parts of this episode I loved. But there are gigantic structural and storytelling problems with it that make it and consequently the entire season suffer for me. Because I've had a problem with certain stories all season long, how they've handled their pacing and their placing in the story, and their culmination is, is disjointed, and it's not smooth, and it's not effective to me. Um, I, I think I don't the think sacrifice, wrong, yeah, I, I, I think the think sacrifice wrong, of Pez Vizsla at the end of last episode, while it was earned in the moment, it was wasted in this episode. So yeah, it's unfortunate. I don't think it's a terrible episode. I just think that we have seen, you know, season one of The Mandalorian was amazing. You start with that gigantic two-part drop, and you end on that image of him touching Grogu's hand. And you go all the way through where he goes, nope, going back for him. And, like, fights his way through and gets Grogu and goes off with him. Season two, it's the journey to Luke Skywalker to drop him off. And then inexplicably, we reconnect them in not their series. In a season of TV that arguably wasn't the best way to do the Book of Boba Fett. And or separate, that's its own thing, and that was really good. But then we come back to this, and it's slowly degrading, and it's it's frustrating. I grew up reading Star Wars. The Heir to the Empire was literally the first Star Wars book I ever read. So while that's a very different story, that is such a good story, and if this is where we're going with all this mess, that's really disappointing. But 
all in all, it was a decent episode. <laughs> well, and I want to come back. I, when we talk about, when we dive into the spoiler horrific content, I want to talk about some of the structural stuff you're talking about, Jake. I there is there is stuff from from theory of state uh, of screen and stage writing that they made horrible mistakes on. Oh, you're right over the whole season, but this episode kind of exemplifies all of that and brings it to a head in a way that the season finale shouldn't have. What it should have done is brought the the plot for season three to a head. And instead what it did is it brought the errors of season three to a head. Unfortunately. 100%. 100%. And yet still managed to hit some important plot beats that I do, that were, there were some enjoyable parts of this episode. As you said, it's a mix. It's a little bit of both, Right. And it, it winds up disappointing, I think, especially because of how we ended last episode, last week's episode, which ended on such a phenomenally strong note and promised so much this week, none of which really was delivered on. But there are things that I loved and I want more of. Yes. So, I don't know. Well, why don't we go ahead and end this particular section of our review and jump into some spoiler things. Um, so we kind of open up a little bit more, talk a little bit more freely. Um, so for all of you wonderful people out there in YouTube land, uh, this is your spoiler warning. Uh, if you have not seen the episode and care about spoilers, uh, just hit pause on our video here, open up a new tab in your web browser, jump over there, watch the episode, and then Come on back and you know you continue watching this video and uh, getting our thoughts. You know, joining us down in the comments. You know, we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. So, this is your spoiler warning. Hey, I'm the Jake the Nerd, the general director here at the Nerd Network, and I would like to invite you to take a look in the description of this video at our link tree page. It has our Patreon. If you like what we do and would like to see better and better content, please consider uh, supporting us financially. Whatever tier you choose, you do get a little back from us, from the basics of a community of nerds you get to hang out and chat with in our Discord, all the way up to some swag items, or getting to appear on a Nerd Network show. Uh, take a look and choose the tier that is right for you, and we would love to have your support in what we are doing here. Enjoy your rest of your content. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get into this. Um, so, gentlemen, you know, we've kind of talked that this is a very mixed episode. You know, it's good, there's bad, there's ugly, there's pretty. Um, so, I wanted to go ahead and start out with kind of our positive thoughts about this episode. Um, you know, kind of the positive story beats, the good ones that we got. Like you said, Jay, like, you know, Mandalore's finally reclaimed from Mandalorians. Grogu's officially a Mandalorian apprentice. Um, Gideon is dead. Maybe it's Star Wars. Um, so, Jake, we'll start with you on some of your thoughts, good thoughts here. I just want to say if Anakin Skywalker was well done, Wolf Giddy is Cajun. <laughs> his, his scream got cut off by fire. There's not a few things to get away from that. Um, there was, like I said, there was some cool things in this episode. Throughout this entire series, anytime a Mandalorian has flown, it has really been apparent that. That's wire work. We know where the CGI budget went in this season now. While we got the Crocker Turtle, we got the, the Fowling Dragons, we got, you know, the, uh, Captain Swamp Thing's ship. This episode is where they poured money. The big, expansive shots with the Mandalorians flying. The, I swear, Flight of the Valkyries should have come in there. Like, da 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 Like, those moments made my blood pump. But I'm telling you, when that fire began to clear and all you see is Grogu with the two of them, and that, that's a picture frame. Like, if Disney doesn't put that into a Black Series figure set, they've lost they've lost money right there. And all I could think of is, we are Grogu. All I could think. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, mostly the action. And none of the, none of the um, dialogue, with one exception, worked for me. None of the interactions worked for me. Um, but I will tell you, when Gideon put that helmet on, 
and said, I will take care of him. All I could hear was Vader. Yeah. All I could hear and feel was Vader. Well, and I think that was not only intentional from a production standpoint. I think in-universe that was intentional. I think oh, yeah. Gideon sees himself as the next Vader. It's the best of all things. Imperial, Sith, Jedi, Mandalorian. He's trying to create the super the super weapon in human form. Yeah. Um, the other thing I thought was really cool was when she pulls out the Darksaber, he pulls out this kick ass like bright purple vibro staff. Elect it was an electro staff, right? Like they like we saw in the prequels with the uh guard droids. Exactly. And there's another piece of the best of both worlds he pulls. Uh that's a that's a Star Trek reference. But it's <laughs> it's 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 awesome that these things like Mercedes uh, Casca flying down, sliding across the platform and shooting rockets out of her kneecaps. Like, how cool was that? It just sucks that the only pieces I liked about this was the action sequences. Like, this this show has such a heart in its story, it just didn't land this episode. But I loved, I loved the ship coming down. I'm kind of wondering why the fighters didn't finish it off, but eh, whatever. Um... Because it's a, a big hunkin' piece of 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 metal falling through the sky, it is difficult for fighters to take out even a moderate sized starship to the point of it explodes. Especially if the crew, even if it's a crew of one, have as their primary objective, don't let the reactor core get blown up, so that they can use the ship as a weapon. That's fair. Uh, yeah, I thought that was cool. Those are my parts I liked. Jay? Um, double down on, on all the stuff Jake just mentioned, especially when the, the main starship was crashing into the base and uh, Ash, or Axe, what is his name? Is it Axe? Axe Wode. Axe. Axe shoots out with a a uh, little uh, magic missile, I mean, a missile from his gauntlet, the, one of the windows, to fly out. Like, you saw that coming. But in the best possible way, like, I know how he'll get out. Watch this. And then he just does it. Like, reaches out his arm, pew, pew, and then jet packs away. Um, I think that the battle, I think some of the some of the on the ground fight scenes and choreography were amazing. I think some of them were not so amazing. Um, I thought that um, Bo Katan v Moff Gideon, especially the the last um, the last couple of beats of it, where she's like, "Yeah, Mandalorians are stronger together," because he's got this attitude like you guys are all fighting amongst yourselves and that's why I'm going to win. And little does he know that for all of the internet's concern that the armorer was about to fake out uh, Bo-Katan, that it turns out they really all are on the same team now. I'm sure there's more stuff to work out, but in that moment, the reason Gideon loses is because the the Mandalorians have done what they've not done in ages, which is pulled together despite their differences. And that was freaking amazing to, to have Din come in in that kind of look out behind you moment where we don't even see him, but Bo-Katan sure does. And, and, and gives Gideon what for verbally, right as Din is giving him what for with his guns, with his blasters. I thought that was an amazing beat for the characters and for the Mandalorian people as a development point. Uh, and not to mention watching Gideon get roasted uh, was he got his comeuppance. I'm I'm deeply satisfied with his getting what he deserved out of all of this. How dare he hijack Mandalore like this? Um, it's not surprising given what he had done in the past. Um, but how dare he? I also thought that while there were some contrivances in them, I thought some of the combat scenes with Din and the various troopers and uh, yes, and the Praetorian guards 
were amazingly choreographed. And I am so glad to see Din continue to be that guy that we saw in the very first episode who, like, I don't care how much you think you've got him. You don't got him. Like, just, like, give up. Like, you are... You can go in warm or you can go in cold. But you are going to go in. Like, it's not worth your time to mess with him. And it was so good to see him from the word go in the episode be like, cool, it's just two of you now. I like those odds. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, and finally, I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't comment on Din Jarin asking R5 for help. Yes. And complimenting him. I think that while I'm sure there's going to be some other folks on the internet who are like, that's not right. I think this is supposed to represent legitimate character growth for him. Um, and his ability to separate himself from, from his young traumatic experience with battle droids from droids that are meant to, that are, that are truly part of the same team and are helping right and our support resources um because two seasons ago din would have din would have rather sat there going i don't know how to get through these ray shields than call r5 for help yeah so a couple things one i think esposito has a fetish for having his characters die in balls of fire uh, because we had Gus Fring and now Gideon. Uh, but beyond that little, um, you know, you're talking about you know Din and, and R5, and you know this this is going to kind of tie into our next section where we start kind of talking about some of the things that didn't necessarily work so well. Um, it makes the episode two episodes ago where Din had this, you know massive regression to hatred of droids make less sense. I hear you, Mark, and I think a piece of that to consider is they're they're going in and mostly dealing with Imperial droids and uh, battle droids from the from the separatists. The the very droids that have been tr trauma inducing and the sources of trauma for Din. He has, I think part of his development is that he has been building individual relationships with individual droids. This is not to say that he's ready and willing to accept all droids, but IG-12, uh, right, um, slash IG-11 uh, and R5, I think represent the right. beginning of his acceptance that not all droids equal battle droids. That being said, I think you are right that there is there is some ham fisting going on here. This is more of the season level pacing and and incongruities uh, that I am absolutely ready to get into in the next section. I think it's a carry forward because at the very beginning of the season, I was frustrated that he was like, I need that one because I trust that one. I need that one. Hey, Pelly, I need a part for that one droid. She's like, how about this one? Okay, cool. Let's roll. And that literally was there to get this moment. Yeah. 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 It's part of the season's inconsistencies as a whole. Um, Does it fit with the other seasons? Yeah. Um, so let's go ahead and start kind of moving into that. Um, I think one of the biggest things, so I'm going to kind of list out a few things that, that I thought didn't work so well, and then we'll, we'll get y'all's, y'all's opinions. Uh, but I think one of the biggest things for me was the absolute nuking of fan investment with the dark saber. Uh, that was huge. Um, the what? Sorry. The, the nuking of fan investment into the dark saber and what it means for the Mandalorians. And, you know, it's just, it's just destroyed in a meaningless scene. Uh, yes. That that was horrible, in my opinion. But we also had little things like contradicting episode four with, when we established that jetpacks have fuel and limits to their distance. And here we have 
flying through the freaking atmosphere into space. Velocity? What yeah. the hell? Uh, you know, I I alluded to it a few minutes ago with with Gideon. You know, Star Wars. You know, make, ensuring that Star Wars can be Star Wars. And you, know, we don't know if Gideon has more clones out there somewhere. So there's always the possibility that Gideon can come back. Um, and the giant question of where the hell were the Mandalorians in Episode Seven? You know, they they've got a lot of work to do to explain that now that that you know. They could have done a better job of what, setting what, up. What do, you, what do you mean? Where are the Mandalorians in Episode Seven? Force Awakens. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. B- big Seven, not Little Seven. <laughs> yes. Ep- sorry. <laughs> movie <laughs> Episode Seven. Yes. Yes. Well, mm. I have thoughts about that. When we get to the th- when we talk about the season wrap up and where this all fits in the larger canon. I have some thoughts because I that also relate to I think some structural mistakes they made this season. So, yeah. So and then you know, CG wise, like most of the CG was good, but there was a lot of bad CG parts. The fact that that, like I said earlier, we got Esposito's actual face for about fifteen seconds in this episode. Uh, he's wearing the helmet almost the entire time. You know, it's just, there was a lot of just little things that kind of added up for me. Some of the fight between um, Gideon and Mando there at the very beginning of their fight was a little bit reminiscent of the Killmonger Black Panther fight in the original Black Panther movie. The Mm -hmm. the movements were too fast and too rapid. While he's got some kind of like uh, piston-y parts to him, it still felt very um, uncanny valley. Is that, is that the right phrase there? Yeah, that's the right phrase. Yeah, that's the right yes. phrase. Yes. Uh, I've never seen Black Panther, but yes. Um, don't yeah, don't this is, bro. He's not the Marvel person. We're going to let him I go. need a break. The Marvel nerd. <laughs> so, Jay, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to you now, sir. So, uh, I have a few things. Uh, the first, speaking of CG, um, I did, broadly speaking, enjoy the horde of Mandalorians descending on the base and doing their thing. It was a lot of fun. That being said, not even from a CG specifically standpoint, from like a choreography standpoint, as much as I enjoyed watching the armor and Bo-Katan yield their personal weapons with great aplomb, um, I think Siege of Mandalore in season seven of Clone Wars was four or five times better choreographed for a very similar scene. And I I, I like Favreau a lot, but I, I think in Star Wars, Filoni is still the better storyteller. And I think that, um, I think Favreau would be well informed to go back and look at when similar kind of things have happened in a purely animated show, which is all CG because Clone Wars was a CG animated series, right? How they were able to really do the choreography in a way that the choreography mattered. And I think that's the big piece there is fight scenes can be spectacles. And even when they are spectacles, they need to be choreographed events that are telling a story like dance does. Fight scenes are a form of dance in terms of production design. We choreograph them the way we choreograph dance. They are telling story through physical movement. And I think much of the of the big all Mandalorians show up and fight all the Imperial whatevers they were, because I'm still not exactly sure are those the dark troopers or is what the clones were going to be the dark troopers, right? Whatever. Right. Subtitles called them super commandos. Okay, so the super commandos. The thank you for that, Jake, because I don't watch with subtitles on. Maybe I really have you to watch should because there's a moment when Grogu's running across that ring, trying yeah. to keep away from the things where it says Grogu laughs. I was like, that's awesome. But I don't feel like that was choreographed. 
I don't feel like that section of the story was being told through the physical movement. And I think that's a, a big loss because we got very, very powerful physical storytelling in Siege of Mandalore that is very similar types of combat and very similar levels of energetics and of types of movement, like literally the jetpacks and all of that, and Mandalorians and, and troopers, right? So um, there's that piece. I think that was a, a big miss. Um, it was cool to watch, but I think it was a big miss from a storytelling standpoint. Um, I, got, I have two more, and I'm just going to go ahead and jump to the to the one that absolutely has to be said, and that is what the flamingo happened with the clone story arc, right? That is the single worst piece of storytelling in Star Wars since uh, Rise of Skywalker. We literally had a the buildup of three seasons of storytelling comes down to um, click the glowy button in an RPG, followed by a line of dialogue, a singular line of dialogue telling us instead of showing us what the mystery box of the last three seasons was in terms of why we wanted Grogu at the beginning of season one. Yep. Like this is, this is like undergraduate film school kind of mistakes, John, what are you doing? Like, I know you know better than this. You have demonstrated it in the earlier seasons. I would rather you had not resolved this plot beat until next season even go ahead and kill off Gideon and let us wonder what is up with the Grogu stuff and bring it back up when you have room to show us instead of tell us we killed off Gideon and now there's a force wielding Gideon in upgraded armor again. Okay, how did that happen? Right? And then unravel and find out that indeed what we all suspected was what was happening, right? Because that also ties back into the Doctor's story in earlier in this season, right? Which I really enjoyed that episode, Mark. And I think it was, I, I agree with you that the time was not utilized well after it was spent. I think they should have, I, I do think they should have spent that time. I just don't think they utilized that investment of time anywhere else in the season the way they should have. It was all scenes I needed to see. I, I really think for the larger picture of the New Republic, we needed to see how bad things really are back at Coruscant post the uh, fall of the Empire, right? And uh, in the early days of the New Republic. And because they never went back and utilized that invested energy and storytelling, it does feel like a waste. And we didn't get the return we should have gotten on that. So I'm I'm with you. And I don't think the answer was to shorten the season to six episodes. I think it was to use what they set up more effectively in the remaining episodes of the season. Not throw it away in two or three lines of dialogue between last episode and this episode. Which is what they did. More telling, not showing. We had that actually with the pirates. Why did the pirates show up and why were they so easy to get rid of and stuff? More tell, not show. Well, I am just, I am very frustrated with uh, Favreau and crew that they would, I, that they would stoop to this level of storytelling. Dave, surely, I don't know, probably what happened is Dave Filoni was busy working Ahsoka because the two series were working somewhat in parallel, Right. And he's usually the one to be like, show, don't tell. So he, I think I think John needed his buddy is really what it came down to. And I'm very unhappy about it. I also think John deeply, deeply wanted to get to where we ended the season. The season with the, he wanted to get to that scene of the homestead and we're working for the New Republic now, sort of. And Navarro has its draw it has ig12 as its uh marshal right he john was like i'm gonna i'm gonna land there no matter what and it's like when uh when you're at the olympics and you can't stick to landing 
Yeah, you. He, he, it's like when you can't stick the landing after doing all of this work to get to the Olympics. It just throws everything else off. Yeah, I and and I still, I still agree that the stuff with with Kane and Pershing was important, like you said. I just think that it would have worked much much better as a standalone, uh, you know, 35, 40 minute you know, thing that they could have put out back in December of he hey here's what's been going on between episodes seasons of Mandalorian and you know get hyped for Mandalorian you know this is this is what you can expect this is what's coming, it would have worked much better standalone and then they then then not coming back to it would not have been a problem we could have just stuck it in the book of boba fett that had so much crap in there that didn't belong it would have been fine there <laughs> i mean come on uh, so jake uh, yes jake lay it on us okay i'm gonna start with the top and jay i know we're gonna disagree on this i i do not i wholesale reject the idea that we should be looking at this as one big story while i agree it is but you know the king of the mountain right now for me although terry metallis is coming for kevin feige uh is the marvel cinematic universe Se uh, phase four aside phases one two and three which we are arguably in phase one of the star wars universe in this yes universe it it told a story where each character had their movie, had their plot, had their stuff, and it wove together in such a fantastic and cohesive way. John Favreau literally birthed that universe. These things, Book of Boba Fett, a quarter of the wasn't about Boba Fett. This show, I'm frustrated with this season and specifically with this episode is it took the Mandalorian and sidelined him completely to, to an extent of his story beats. We had the big giant cliffhanger at the end fixed in the first two minutes by himself. Yes. Grogu came in at the last minute and helped him and then tried to spray back on his armor, which was absolutely hysterical and adorable, but whatever cheapen that. Um, the fact that he's been struggling to wield the dark saber for a season and a half of TV, cheapen that by just saying, "Cool, here you go, Bo, have it." Um, the removal of his helmet to just come back, dip in the water, be redeemed, and then be accepted by the other Mandalorians, but still keep the helmet on, even though if you notice at the end, the helmet piece is not in the Creed anymore. Don't know if y'all got that. But when she has Ragnar do the Creed, doesn't say anything about the helmet anymore. That said, every choice made for the Din Djarin character, to me, felt like they were minimizing him in the story. And I'm sorry, but we spent two seasons with this guy as the Mandalorian being called the Mandalorian. There's a simple change that would have made this make so much more sense. Star Wars, Mandalore. Or Star Wars, The Mandalorians with an S. Completely changes the entire story. And and I get what they're trying to do in this season, but they're doing it at the expense of the character that literally Disney Plus sat on the back of for a year and a half. Well, and, and Jake, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. And I, my commentary is in art because I for all of the success that Favreau and Filoni are having and for their continued rise in power, apparently from what we can tell within Lucasfilm, Kathleen Kennedy still rules the roost. We still every year get told about a slate of movies and are expected to be like Charlie Brown with the football and be excited that we're going to get these <laughs> movies. Right. Yeah, I'm and tired of landing on my ass. Different... Yeah, right. And in the meantime, Filoni and Favreau are the ones carrying the the weight of Star Wars' success almost assuredly within some sort of box drawn by upper management, Kathleen Kennedy, and her other direct report. So I think part... I, I mean, I'm reading a lot between the lines here. 
But I don't think that we can compare Favreau and Filoni's work to Feige, to Feige's and uh, Metallus's work because I don't think they have the necessary power freedom. and freedom to do things that way. And so, I agree. Would it would would it be better if we had truly, truly one? If we got some films, because part oh, yeah. of the MCU success is if is in the films. Because some of these stories, like Book of Boba Fett, should have been a film. One hundred percent. Right. It should have been a one off film. Right about how he came back. Right, filling in the bu- the blanks about where about how he showed up in. And two, right? That would have been an amazing story in film. Can you imagine that on the big screen, right? Um, some of the some of the stuff with Luke Skywalker and Ahsoka and Grogu maybe could have been a film. Can you imagine if they actually unpacked that Academy a little bit, right, and had a Grogu film, right? Things like that. If they had the freedom to really do an MCU that was like they're now doing with an, where they mix and cross between series and films and use the right medium for the right, the right piece story. of the story, right? Sure. I think it would be infinitely better. I also would not be surprised if what's going on is they are wrestling power and and storycraft where they can and we are left with this because Lucasfilm is not being run like Marvel when yeah. it should be um i i have never i have told you guys all the time i grew up reading star wars i loved i grew up with han and leia's kids the 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 real ones um and i cried when their youngest son died he died in this glorious like explosion of the force sacrificing himself it was great i cried when chewbacca died because they dropped a planet on his face like that's how you kill chewbacca it frustrated me in 2014 when they walked in and said all right all those stories they mean nothing go away i have never been one of those people who's like we need to fire kathleen kennedy we need to get rid of her but after watching this and hearing the um kind of I don't want to say scuttlebutt, but the rumors of putting Grogu back with Mando in Book of Boba was her idea. Having that she's apparently had a falling out with Pedro Pascal and John Favreau. And that's why you had no Pedro face this season. Like, here's my thing. She is a phenomenal producer. She'd done E.T. She'd produced Jurassic Park. She did a whole bunch of other stuff. Stay in your lane. If you well, are not a storyteller, don't. And and some of that is that Lucasfilm has has been run until now by the head storyteller, right? Yeah. And so Lucasfilm as a company doesn't know how to operate with a non storyteller in the lead. Yes, right. Um, especially not a storyteller that owns that really embodies the story we are telling, not just like because I don't think if you put Steven Spielberg in charge that we would have been we would have been better. But I think yeah. we would have been still challenged, right? Because Lucasfilm was built around George. And I still don't understand why Disney won't put, like, m- move Dave Filoni and John Favreau into some sort of, like, dual-headed replacement for Kathleen Kennedy. Because I have, for years, been down on Kathleen Kennedy because I can only see all the failures to launch movies that she personally announces when, like you said, what she does is produces. So what the hell, Kathleen? Why can you not get movies out the door for this company? That's my point. I am a storyteller. I know that my strength is sitting at a Dungeon Master table telling a story. I am not a dancer. You will not see me on the dance floor. This does we're not we're getting a little bit off topic from this specific uh, episode of Mandalorian. Um, so when the, Kathleen yeah. Kennedy showed up, the episode sign up. <laughs> all right. Um, yes, we all hate Special K. Um, wow. <laughs> I don't hate her. I just wish she'd stay out of the uh, damn volume. 
So um, let's kind of uh, start wrapping it up here. Um, I did kind of want to. Um, Sorry, Mark. You're just, just like, oh, God, everyone shut up so we can get out of here. You're, you're fine. Um, I did kind of want to do a, a you know, small, small piece, you know, from everybody on kind of the season as a whole. Um, you know, we've, we've already kind of discussed a lot of things. We discussed like the thing with, with Kane and Pershing and, you know, they had the whole thing with the freaking mythos arm where, you know, we get five seconds at the end of this episode again with it. Um, uh, you know, I, I personally think that season as a whole season three of book of, uh, season three of Mandalorian. Oh, man. You said it right. Right. <laughs> season three of, of Mandalorian uh, as a whole and episode eight, this finale in particular, uh, the closest comparison I can make is season eight of Game of Thrones. Yep. That ball was dropped that hard. Yeah, I think it comes down to two things really one i think that they over foreshadow so besides the stuff we already talked about they over foreshadowed the mythosaur is a is one of the biggest examples of that but i think the business with um gideon and the dark trooper clones and stuff is another example of over foreshadowing so they couldn't they were setting things up in season three in a way that felt like it should have paid off in season three, that's really going to pay off. I think the Mythosaur thing at this point is really going to pay off in like season five. Maybe. No, I think it'll be the movie. I think that, Thrawn comes to Mandalore. That might be, that might be true. And the Star Destroyer gets taken out by that sucker. I I, I don't know specifically. Grogu with I, the we, rebuilt dark saber on the back of the Mythosaur. Well, that, that is the thing. I do, I do think. After what we saw in the ending of this ep of this season, Grogu, everyone that's been saying on the internet, Grogu is the Mandalorian, that is the real one, that is the ultimate story arc. I think is a hundred percent true, and I think he's it's him, not Bo Katan, that's going to ride on the back of that Mythosaur. And oh, by the way, I just want to put this out there because I haven't seen anyone else talk about it. Kathleen Kennedy announced that Ray movie, right? That's about the rebuilding of the Jedi. Hold on. Hold on. My prediction is Grogu will be in it. Oh, that's a foregone. Right. But, but that's Grogu the won't thing. save it from Ray. See, I don't have a problem with Ray. I have a problem with other pieces of the of the sequels. But I think it, I think that that is going to be where we unify I think that movie is going to be the movie that unifies the storytelling between the Mandoverse and the sequel, the post-sequel era. I think there will be some degree of let us just quietly move past the sequels. I think everyone understands that we need to not linger on them too much. Building a highway bypass. Yes. But I think this Ray movie is going to deeply incorporate Grogu and that what we're going to see in the Mandoverse on top of the telling of the Thrawn story, which I'm super excited about, will be how we get to the place where Grogu is able to step into that part of the era as a Jedi Master. Or, in, or as Ahsoka would say, not a Jedi, but still a, a deep, powerful Force user. Yes. Uh, so... Uh... I think this season of the of the four of the heir to the empire saga or Grogu and friends or whatever the heck we're going to call this. <laughs> um, I think season one was awesome. They doubled down in season two and they rolled a hard six and it was better. I think it really began to stumble in season two and a half or a book of Boba Fett. And then they just smashed into a wall here. Um, I think of those four seasons of story, I think this is the lowest point for me so far, and that's that's unfortunate. Um, I wonder how much of this is because they're having because they are having to to adjust to things like the Rangers of the Republic being a thing that they can't do 
because of Gina yeah. Serrera. Well, and that's the thing that I, I was listening to a podcast. I went to get ice cream before we filmed. When I went, came back, listening to a podcast where they're talking about how they have really taken Din and put him into that role now because yes. he's kind of a ranger. They actually called it the independent contractor of the New Republic. Yeah, um, which I think is is about right, but it's it's kind of true. Like, it's unfortunate that she. It's I think it's a combination of too much plot, too much foreshadowing. They put so much pressure on this finale, and nothing paid off. They foreshadowed a spy. They foreshadowed the mythosaur. They foreshadowed clones, and boom, 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 nothing happened. Like this, this finale was basically cut and dry, big battle, okay. And and that's really unfortunate. That's 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 a poor story. And story. and the way that it, it ended with the final shot of Dan and Grogu at their house, like that whole thing of them that getting the IG Nick head, head com show. You know, getting getting the IG eleven head and making him the Marshal of Navarro, and, and getting yeah the, the sitcom shot of them on the porch, like. That is a shot in a in a framing that's appropriate for a series finale, not a season finale. Yeah, it's it was a hard turn. They were trying to stick a landing that they could never stick. They stuck it about as well as Casca did when she hit that platform, fell off the side, and shot them. Yeah, I actually saw a, a gift that. To, uh, I think it was from the season of Mandalorian, where where Din lands on a platform and like falls and rolls forward, and and that was that was the comparison to how they stuck the landing on this one. At this point, I think they're like Din at the end of season one when he's got the grappler on the tie and he's like ah, just hanging on for dear life. So yeah. I don't know. We'll see. So we shall see. Um, I think so, Soka will be the tell. I, I think, think there's. It's be the tell. I, I think there either. Here's the thing. At this point, Ahsoka has to be the best thing they put out, because there is so much pressure on that show right now. One, it's Ahsoka. Two, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's predominantly female led, with Sabine, Ahsoka, and Hera. Um. And it's the next step of this story that at this point, now the last year of story has been misfires. So there is so much pressure on that series to succeed. Um, I, I'll be back for it. <laughs> August. Um, yep. So, all right. Well, I think that's going to be about wrapping it up for today for us. Uh, so, Jay, why don't you go ahead and tell all these wonderful people out there that have listened to us ramble on for 45-plus minutes at this point. Uh, <laughs> tell them who you are, where they can find we you, were all that good stuff. insightful commentary on a complex story that's being uh, told in one of our favorite franchises. We rambled. Yeah. Anyway, you can find me at my uh, website, thejsimmons.com. J is the letter is just the letter, like it is in the nameplate below. From there, you can bounce out to my other geekery things, uh, my open source hardware contributions, and even my work as a in my day job as a digital engineer. Awesome, awesome, Jake, sir. Uh, you can find me at the Jake Third on Twitter, Twitch, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. And you can also find me as the Dungeon Master for Adventures in Nevermore, where this, well, I don't know where you're at on the screen right now, but the Dark Side Malik is one of our players. And here shortly, in just a couple of months, we're going to be doing a live stream Star Trek show where uh, Mr. J. Simmons here will be our captain. Awesome. awesome. To it, Jake. I am too. <laughs> yeah, it, it should, should be fun. Um, we don't talk about Star Trek here. Oh, the, they're the enemy. <laughs> I'll cover Gogu's ears while we say Solar <laughs> Series title. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's all all nerdum. It's all good. Um, I as always in Dark Side Malak at Dark Side Malak on Twitter and Twitch. Um, yeah, this is wrapping up the Mandalorian for us. TV content wise, we've got like a two week break just before the fourth. 
Um, and visions will be visions two will be dropping, um, as well as uh, a young, very young child kind of focused uh, series called Young Jedi Adventures, which I'm actually looking forward to simply because it takes place during the High Republic, uh, which is currently one of my favorite eras of Star Wars. They've been doing much better there than they have been in, in Mandalorian this season. Um, so, but also next Friday is the drop of the new video game, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, the continued story of Cal Kestis. So uh, I will be playing that on Twitch as well as putting VFDs and all that good stuff on the YouTube channel here on the Nerd Republic. So check that out. Until then, you like this video, comment, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the notifications when I do start posting those videos to YouTube of the gameplay and when we do Visions, of, of course, of Soka later this summer. So we appreciate all of you hanging out and listening to us and you know, it really does, you know, give us joy to bring this content to you guys. So we thank you. And until next time, may the force be with you. Hey, thanks for tuning into this video here on the Nerd Network. John, what else do we have here on the network? Well, make sure you check out all of our shows uh, and our new shorts. This is uh, something new for us, and we've been having a lot of fun with it. But we cover, with both of these, we cover big franchises and some more of the niche entertainment that you may or may not already be following closely yourself. Our primary shows include Nerd Talk. Uh, obviously, this is our premiere show. This is where we go over reviews of current shows as their uh, current episodes of shows as they're coming out and reactions to trailers as they happen. In addition, we have Adventures in Nevermore. This is uh, a real fun series going through a D&D &D, uh, game and, and all the hilarity that ensues. We also have our show Nerds in Conversation. This is uh, a social commentary show taking uh, subject matter and, and headlines and, and going through them from a nerd perspective uh, in, in a more interesting way. In addition, we have News with the Nerds. This is our headline show for giving, uh, giving you all the, the best in, in news information for the week, uh, again, from the nerd perspective. And then finally, we have my baby. We have The John's Vault. It's our journey into retro content. We basically review movies that, that are important to me, that I love, that I've, I've known for years and years and years, and Jake here has never seen. So it's a fun way to go back and look at some of the things from yesteryear uh, that uh, that we may be seeing through fresh eyes. Keep an eye out for more shorts. Uh, that That is one of our biggest new things that we're doing. We're going to have plenty of those coming out as well. And thank you for tuning in here to this video. If you like what we're doing and you'd like to support us or follow us, remember to subscribe to the channel. Hit that like button so YouTube will promote these videos and we can share them with all of our nerdy friends because the more nerds, in the conversation, the better the conversation is. And if you'd like to support us financially so we can do better, we can have better product delivered to you, check out our Patreon in the link tree. But from all of us here at the Nerd Network, thank you. Have an awesome day. Have a great rest of your day and be safe.